Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, it is uh, uh, honor and privilege of the Photographic Society of Sri Lanka to have Chitral with us today, uh, doing a presentation on making a photograph in the wild by Chitral. Why I say it's an honor and privilege is that uh, Chitral is one of the most respected photographers in the industry. Uh, in his 35 years as a photographer, he has maintained very, very high standards and high ethical practices. And I can see that uh, he is passing that to the next generation. He takes his daughters to the park, and I'm sure he is teaching <coughs> all the practices that a photographer should follow, uh, which is actually very much lacking these days. I mean, that that that's an immense contribution by itself. Um, as the vice president of the John Keyes Group and as the head of Nature Tales, his contribution as a conservationist has been immense. Uh, he's uh, showcased Sri Lanka to the world by uh, bringing in uh, high-end photographers uh, with whom he had long relationships. So um, his uh, career as a, as, a, as a photographer, he's, uh, he's been a 35-year long, um, uh, long span he has had. Uh, his first photographic award was received from Prince Philip, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, when he was 17 years old. Uh, and his uh, passion to showcase what's wild and free in Sri Lanka on a world stage has, has attracted 22 documentaries, documented crews to Sri Lanka, including BBC's Blue Planet, two filming Spurn Wales in Trincomalee. Chitra manages an award-winning na naturalist team at Cinnamon Hotels, and their sustainable efforts have been recognized by two PAT Gold Awards, while Chitral was honored by the prestigious Chairman's Award of CSR by the John Keels Holding. <coughs> continues to operate his brand of photographic safaris both here and around the world. So actually before, while all the people are joining, we were discussing some of the programs that he's going to have next year. Uh, I hope uh, everyone will enjoy uh, the presentation and I, my earnest appeal is that uh, to get involved in the dialogue and ask questions uh, as and when required. Thank you, Chitral, and over to you. Thank you, Hiranti, for such such a colorful uh, introduction. I, I, you, you, uh, I must say that the honor is all mine uh, to do this for the society. Uh, it's a great privilege to uh, connect with all these uh, like-minded people and uh, serious photographers, professionals, uh, die-hard enthusiasts. It also gives me a few goosebumps because I'm lecturing to the converted. So uh, I, I, I thought I, must, I might not talk any theory and major tips because we're all in the game. But uh, I just thought we will remind ourselves of some of the basics when you're really keen on nature photographs because uh, sometimes people ask me, why do you do this for all your life? Because I was, I mean, I was very small when I started, only just 11 years when Tata took me to the park first time. But I was a serious photographer when I was about 15 years onwards. But uh, all these years, I've uh, kind of banked on a few basics, which have kind of worked out very well for me. Uh, and when, when we say photographer, there are many aspects of photography, so I'm going to skip this slide altogether. But this is the key thing. If you are, if you are a nature photographer, then you are either a bird, bird specialist. Uh, you can either focus on mammals, big cats, uh, macro and rainforests underwater, which is completely another uh, section of photography because it needs uh, personal skills as well as very different gear. But then you can also be a bit of many things. That's what most of us are. So when, when you are doing that, I just focus on a few things and I, I always remind the kids and the younger photographers of these things, focus and concentrate on light because out there in the open, in the wilderness, in the natural world, we really don't have any control of the light other than when we get lucky. So look for the light. Light does most of the work uh, in making that photograph. Always focus on the backgrounds because uh, it's backgrounds, backgrounds and backgrounds. You really can't put enough focus on the backgrounds because if you get clutter in a shrub, shrub jungle, uh, you lose the picture. Uh, it's almost worthless because if you are serious into a leopard photograph or a bird, if you don't have the right background, you just have a, a record shot. There's nothing else in it. Uh, then, of course, keep an eye on the depth of field because uh, 
a lot of the, the, the younger generation sometimes gets uh, carried away because the cameras nowadays are pretty advanced and they tend to do most of the work. And if you don't keep an eye on the depth of field and if you are if you are set yourself up for a bird and then immediately focuses on a group of animals like a herd of elephants or something else, then you will lose the, the picture because more than 10% uh, of the image will not be in, in focus. The target or the goal as a good nature photographer is definition or as we call it razor sharp or pin sharp images. The enemy we have to deal with is camera shake. So if you just keep these basics in mind, if you nail those up, you're done, you, you're basically geared up. And with the interest all of us has as members of the society and as key nature photographers, you're good to go. Uh, the kit bag, again, uh, if you're a good nature photographer, you're very keen on it. You can be between a DSLR and a mirrorless. I'm not gonna talk about SLRs now because I think now we've all grown out of it. And last week I think was great news for some of us who are contemplating on doing the hybrid or the crossover from DSLR to mirrorless because both uh, Canon and Sony announced some very interesting news. I'm, I'm not going to talk too much of brands here because that's not the focus, but the mirrorless generations are now gradually catching momentum and it's going to be uh, the way forward. I mean, the, it's the same way in 2001, two when DSLRs came into the scene, uh, some of us automatically went into it with a bit of skepticism because it's natural. You've grown up with great cameras like the Nikon F4 or the Canon A1s and then you're suddenly going into this little camera which immediately shows what you take. Uh, it was a risky business as we thought, but it wasn't. It worked out brilliantly. And uh, I think two years from now, most of us will be on a, D on a mirrorless than a DSLR or you can have one of each. So that's the way forward. Don't forget to carry a wide lens and that can be a mid-range wide or a professional wide like 16 to 35 because you never know when a wide lens comes into play. A mid-range zoom is very important uh, and it can be a 80 to 400 or 100 to 400. Now some makes offer 100 to 500. I know uh, the recent brands now offer 200 to 600 and some say that's all you need. So you got to pick where you want to be. You got to decide what the budget is and pick the gear. Then of course, it's great to have a prime telephoto because that is the ultimate in, in outdoor photography. Memory cards, media, car, the laptop, and there you go. So nature photography is all about being outdoors. Uh, wildlife photography is about connecting with the natural world. And I love to work with children. And I, I take my own kids as well as we conduct many camps in, uh, in some of our hotels in Habarona and we take 20, 30 kids out in the opens. And it's, it's all about enjoying the time you spend in the outdoors. It's not always about beating uh, one of your colleagues' uh, number of likes you get on Facebook by uploading the pictures. It's about just being out there, enjoying the moment, and just being you know, blissful and happy and almost uh, uh, thankful that you have this amazing time out in the natural world, which most people don't have. <laughs> So if you're in the parks in Sri Lanka, uh, the early morning light is very, very crucial. Uh, many years ago, we were probably basing ourselves uh, in, in, in park bungalows, mostly Yala, Kumana, Vilpatsu, and we would be 10 minutes to six, you're out, and you're always on the track. So that early morning breaking light is very, very nice. The, the, the iridescent light gives you the glowing of blue in the sky. It also happens late evening, but often now uh, with the traffic congestion and uh, the park regulations of having to drive out of the park by six, you don't have the opportunity to catch this kind of light uh, inside the park, unless of course you catch something outside of it. Uh, so as, as the dawn breaks, it's quite amazing. And don't forget to photograph moments like this. If you're with a friend, uh, I was here with a good friend of mine, a brilliant photographer from London, uh, Paul Goldstein, and Paul and I were photographing at Yala and this amazing cloud setting, almost like a tornado, it, it wasn't. It's just that it just lasted for about 10 minutes. So we paused for a moment and photographed it. And I just thought if I capture my friend with that light setting, it actually means a little more than just the sky. So that's what I always said, enjoy the moment for me. Being outdoors is probably possibly the best thing, you know, I best amount of uh, 
enjoyment I, I get uh, other than when I'm with my family and kids. So, so enjoy moments and catch these moments with your friends and share it with them because you know these are these will make lifelong friendships with your with your colleagues. Uh, early morning light is always magic as photographers we call it the golden hour and uh, with dawn breaks by soon after six until about 7 30 the light is very soft and it gives you that glow of yellow orange it gets more orange in the evening but uh, this was just Yala six months ago, just before the COVID issues, I was driving into the park and it was just uh, uh, at the first kilometer of it before Patiawala and uh, uh, the, the peacock was there before the sun actually came to this point. So I, rather than probably, I may have missed the leopard on the rock that morning, but I thought, I told my friends, look, we're gonna you know, sit here for 10 minutes until the, the sun gets the right position to catch this. And I was just keeping my fingers crossed that I'm giving up a possible leopard encounter for this, and I was hoping that the peacock won't fly away. And it obliged. And, uh, you know, the peacock was still there when the sun rose, and that little, you know, that golden light and the little bit of clouds just catches that moment. And it kind of shows the mood in the jungle that time. It all, you know, it's almost like after pressing the reset button, the jungle is awakening to a new day, and all these animals have to go around. Uh, their, their lifestyles for survival, food, uh, and, and, and it's just that early morning mood, which is very clearly seen in that first hour. So don't miss those moments. And I always tell people to catch them. Then of course, uh, uh, we all love leopards and you know, uh, sometimes we, we almost get branded as leopard photographers. I, I don't want to call myself a leopard photographer, but some people do uh, tag that on me. Uh, yes, I do love leopards. I photographed this animal oh. for, for all my life since I was 11 years old. And catching leopards uh, with different light early morning is, is absolutely magic. Uh, this was about seven years ago. I can still remember it was at uh, Valmalkema. And there were two cubs and a mother. And uh, we would have tried this for almost uh, two months consecutively. And one morning it happened, uh, the cubs were out. There was a kill by the water hole. There was a couple of large crocs challenging the leopards. So we got all these interaction. But uh, just as about quarter past seven, when we thought the, 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 the encounter was over, one of the cubs, I think it was about uh, a year at this time, you can see it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adolescent. Uh, it climbed this little rock, that, that rock is still there at Valmalkema, and just looked up almost giving that side light and it lit him up and it almost looked like a cheetah pose. And that was the moment. And I probably spent two months to catch these cubs, but I, I got all, all three, the mother and the two cubs in that sequence, but I, I still like this image most because it just gives you that warm, brilliant morning light on a, on a perfect um, a jungle morning. And it is illuminating perhaps the best uh, cat of them all. Uh, I, I do sometimes uh, when I'm going to uh, Trinco on work, uh, as, as Cinnamon has a, a as couple of aircrafts, if the seats are empty, they always love me to, to hitch a ride because I can save a seven and a half hour drive with just 50 minutes and I, I'm in China Bay. But uh, I was always telling the captain when I board, I said, look, Cap, uh, if the clouds are free, you know, can you come down at Adam's Peak so that I can photograph it? So. I've done it three, four times. This was one morning because the flight takes off at 7.25 in the morning at BIA and you are passing Adams Peak within 15 minutes. So it's that time at that height, it's very cloudy, but this day was just perfect. It was one of those days, the clouds were just nice. It was white, it was not rainy at all. It's brilliant sunshine. And I think we were flying around 11,000 feet and uh, I had a British captain, he knew me. So he said, uh, okay, let's come down to 7,000 feet so that the photographers on board, he casually mentioned photographers on board, but I was definitely, I was the only one. <laughs> Others would have been photographing with their phones. So I used a, a 70 to 200 lens and that was like, you know, I mean, it was just awesome to see this site, you know, perfectly lit uh, Sunday morning on the way to Trinco. And Sri Lanka, by the way, is very photogenic by, yeah. Uh, if you had just done a balloon ride from, from Damulla, 
or you've taken a, a scenic flight, just flying around four or 5,000 feet, this country is stunningly beautiful from there. Uh, talking about backgrounds, I, I did mention how important backgrounds are. This is just a, a mongoose. Uh, it's just a, a common animal, not an animal where you would pose to photograph with any great interest other than uh, if it just gives you this background. So it was a rainy day a couple of years back and you can see this is the road and there were big puddles of water on the road. It's almost like right now. It's, it's, uh, we have intermittent showers in Yala and some of the roads are like this. So the, the, the mongoose came along the road, uh, sniffed the water. I think he was not going to drink. It was actually trying to see whether there were little frogs or uh, little insects in the water. And he came around. We stopped giving it a lot of, lot of distance. I was shooting off a 600, so I had the luxury of shooting from about 30 meters. There was just one other photographer with me, so it was easy, just two guys clicking well. And I said, look, let's give it space. Hopefully, it will not get spooked. And he came right around the water. And at this moment, it was just about to move forward. It has raised his right hand. And almost like a supermodel gave me that one little moment. I didn't realize that I caught it, I was shooting first. But when I previewed, I thought, well, that's cute. So as nature photographers, when you see common animals and animals that sadly doesn't, these animals sadly doesn't naturally create a lot of enthusiasm. It shouldn't be that way. We should be interested in all the animals that is in the jungle, but we also do pick and choose. We have our favorites. So not often somebody will stop for 20 minutes to photograph a mongoose. But if you see the background available, spend the time because even a common animal on a wet day at the right background makes a pretty interesting photograph. Uh, when, when events happen like this, you need to be able to sometimes predict what's going to happen. Uh, crocs generally do go for the deer and young buffaloes during this time of the year in Yala. Uh, we should be having pretty, pretty harsh weather dry for the last 45 days. But this year is different, as you know, uh, weather is changing across the world. But this was in 2011, 2012. I was filming with Ammonite for National Geography. And uh, there were three film crews in the park. I was with the producer. And he was just filming for fun while the professional crews were in two other jeeps. And uh, it was Martin Dawn, the great cameraman, the engineer cameraman from London. And he said, Chitra, let's go and see whether we can catch a croc attacking deer. And I said, Martin, you know, for the last, I, I said about 30 years of doing this, I only seen it twice. He said, okay, let's go. And I took him around Heenwava, then I took him around uh, Darshanavava, and I came to Komavava. And Martin being a, such a keen eye, he was like at least 15 years older than me. He picked a croc that was hiding on a little depression. If I may show you with my cursor, the croc was hiding in this depression made by a buffalo wallowing in the mud. So this is what happens as the water recedes inwards, the buffaloes lie on the edge for the, for the mud. And when the buffaloes go out, it creates a little depression for the crocs to go and hide. And all you could see is a few pricks of the tail. And Martin saw these edge of the tail and I said, I think a croc is in waiting. So I also looked through my binocular and I said, yes, it looks like a croc. And we saw this animal around, I think 1045, because we've gone around the park, Komava was like the fourth stop. And from 10.45, we had sandwiches and drinks and we waited till about four in the evening, nothing happened. So we drove back. I think we saw a glimpse of a leopard crossing the road, came back to uh, the hotel dinner. Next day morning at 5.30, we left. And I was trying to get Martin to a leopard location. He said, no, 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 we are going to the same spot because our friend should be still there waiting for the deer. And I said, Martin, we spent seven and a half hours yesterday. He said, yeah, that's what we're going to do today. So we just, I, I told my crew, put a lot of cokes and water because that's what you need. Because in late July, in Komavava, on a bunt where it doesn't offer you too much shade, when you have to stay there for nine hours, it really does, you know, the heat does get to you. And that day, by 11 o'clock, the first attack took place. And this wasn't the first one. This was at two plus in the afternoon. So in the next three, we, we banked ourselves for three days on the Komavava bunt. And three days into eight hours, I was like, uh, I mean, almost a day on the bun. 
We would have gone through 50 bottles of Coke and countless bottles of water, but it was worth it. We had three attacks. Fortunately for the deer, all three times the spotted deer got lucky. Their reflexes beat the attack of the croc. I was happy, uh, but, uh, but the filming sequences were amazing. And uh, you know, it, it was aired on Nat Geo, so good for Martin, good for me, and also good for the deer. So what I wanted to tell you was that if you see and if you can predict something is going to happen, invest the time. Don't run around the park. Don't get tempted by telephone calls saying there's a leopard on a tree because you might dash onto a place and see 5% of a leopard you know, in a, on a tree in a, in a leopard traffic jam. So that's not, if you see and if you can, if your intuition tells you something is going to happen, invest the time. It may not happen, but if it happens, you know, voila, it, it, it's just, just amazing. Uh, this was in Vilpatu uh, three years ago. I was uh, doing a reke with a, a South African photographer and uh, uh, he was there for the leopards, but then we, we didn't see leopards in Vilpatu after four days. Uh, that was a dry patch. We saw many bears. Then, of course, we saw the leopards when we drove to Yala for the next five days. It was brilliant. And at the end of the safari, this was one of the best moments that this bear came along the road uh, close to Maradan Madhur, climbed a palu tree, gave us this brilliant pose, then went higher and started profusely feeding on palu. And after a while, there's a lot of pandemonium on the tree because the red ants started attacking it. So, I mean, little of the face was seen on the top of the branches because the branches are covering the bear. But I filmed it. Where there was about at least 100 red ants on his face. So he was fighting the red ants while feeding on the palu. So this is great interaction between species the troubles a bear has to go to pick what it loves, loves to eat. But when we came to Yala, we then saw the, the leopard, so it ultimately spanned out to be a brilliant safari. Uh, for, for, the, for the gear lovers, I was using a 500 millimeter F4 Canon for this and a, and a 1DX Mark I at the time. <clears throat> this was Yala last year. <clears throat> this was July last year. I, was, I spent about seven days in Yala and there is this one big sloth bear who lives on the Valmalkema Road. If you go past the gala, uh, further deep into the forest, there is a massive rocky outcliff onto the left. That's where the hideaway is. We spend every day in the morning between 8.30 and 10 on this stretch. And uh, we saw the bear twice. And very funnily, one morning it came along the main road, crossing from the Gombagasvala side, all the way, we kept on going ahead of the bear and somewhere between the start of the Valmalkima Road and the main rock, there was a little rock. This is what you see the bear seated on. And it came to this point where I'm showing you on the cursor and it disappeared. Would you believe that there is a massive indent here and that must be easily four feet depression here. And there's a lovely kema, as we call it. Uh, and and, and, and it, it is in other words, a rock pool of water. So the bear completely climbs down into this rock pool, have a really good cooling off a bath, and it reappeared after three, four minutes. And I was just hoping that it will do this, and it did exactly that. And you know, when, when a dark animal does that and millions of droplets fly off, it is, it's very profound and it, it's, it's, it's a telling story. Uh, just of course, uh, for the technique, you need to make sure that your shutter speed is up and and you know, at least you're shooting at one five hundredth of a second so that you, you freeze the moment. You can also go the other way, slow it down and try to capture the shape, but uh, it's a risky option because this doesn't happen all the time. And if you go the other way and if you miss it, if everything gets shaken up, then you'll lose the moment. So I, I took the safe option up. Uh, bird photography is always interesting. It's a, it's a speciality in nature photography, but uh, for photographers like me who are a bit of everything, uh, you can always have one eye focused on the jungle to hear the bird calls. And if you see a little flower picker or something with the right background, as I said at the start, backgrounds matter a lot. And if you open the, shot, you open the aperture wide and throw the background into complete disarray, even a tiny bird in a very awkward angle can become uh, somewhat beautiful. So always remember that with, with birds, have a keen eye. You would often hear the bird before you see it. So if your ears are fine-tuned to what's around you, if occasionally you switch off the Jeep engine and listen to the jungle, 
you would hear that the birds are around and then of course you will see. Uh, these are common birds, you know, they are even in our gardens in Colombo, but this is actually at the Cinnamon Lodge Hotel. We have a butterfly garden in the hotel, two acres of wasteland we converted into a butterfly garden and we put about a thousand plants of ideal larval host plants to attract the butterfly. So what we didn't know that is that we, we actually worked with Dr. Michael van der Putten, the, the, one of the best lepidopterists in the country. So when we created this, we wanted the butterflies to rush in because we're putting the ideal plants for them to either feed or lay their eggs. But we had a bonus there because when the butterflies came and laid the larvae and the eggs, here was the birds trying to feed on the butterfly larvae. So you had both coming in. So if ever you are around the Cinnamon Lodge property, uh, don't fail to in the morning to walk across to the butterfly garden with a 300 millimeter lens on a monopod and uh, you might be able to catch something very similar. And this is just handheld. It's a perfect morning around nine o'clock. So a lot of sun and uh, uh, it wasn't too difficult to get the pitch. Uh, I'm now taking you all to a bit of whale watching in Trinco. We started whale watching in uh, uh, some of the work we did at uh, Walker's Tours and Cinnamon Hotels uh, was back in 2007, eight, when we launched whale watching in Mirissa. Uh, we were one of the first teams, of course, along with Gihandi Silva Vijayaratna's team from Jetwing, who were doing the Rekes. Uh, there were both teams out at sea uh, trying to find the whales of Mirissa. And uh, we both found the whales. And uh, when Mirissa got a little busy after 2009, when the conflict in the island uh, ceased, there was a lot of tangible peace and Mirissa started becoming a little too busy. I unplugged my Mirissa operation. I went to Trinco because uh, John Keys had a hotel there called Club Oceanic, which the group started renovating. So I went there even before the hotel was done up, just about seven months after the conflict ended and we were at sea trying to find the whales in 2010. And uh, I can remember the commander of the East and Sri Lankan Navy, uh, the Rear Admiral uh, Kolombage was very, very helpful. I went to see him because the fast attack craft so I had sea and we were in a tiny 20 foot boat with a 15 horsepower toy engine. And when these speed boats go across the sea, it creates such a ripple that we almost topple over. So I had to go and meet the Navy commander and ask him permission to be at sea and tell him to be, tell him that the gunboats have to be a little kind so that we can find the whales. And this rear admiral was so helpful. And he said, Chitra, go out there and do your tourism work. We want the tourists to now come back to Trinco. And so there we were. And 2010, we launched whale watching in Trinco. And to date, every season, we are watching whales. And then we not only found blue whales in Trinco, we saw the sperm whales. And sperm whale is, is, a, is a matriarchal society, just like elephants. They, they live in groups. And when a single boy comes into the, the pod, the girls start showing off. They do, they do full body breaches like what you see. And... Uh, of course, what you generally see from a boat is the tail fluke like this. But uh, when the dolphins start performing, it's quite magical. Uh, what you see here is a mixed bird of uh, bottlenose and uh, spinners. Uh, they, are, they are very playful. I was just seated on the bow with a short lens. I never carry large lenses at sea because it's pretty useless. Uh, you know, uh, uh, an 18 to 105 is all you need to get, get pictures like this because the dolphins come very close to the boat because they want to play with you. And uh, you just have to manage the, the, the devil's advocate here. Uh, it, it's, it's rather difficult at sea. Why I say this because uh, you have Murphy's law. Uh, you, have, you have the animal that is moving all the time and you're sitting on a platform, which is your boat, which is also moving. Mm. So you got to just manage that you got to handhold it and ensure that the pan and the movement of the boat counteracts with your hand so that your image stabilization is achieved maximum. And once you get the hang of it, it makes it easy. And then you can get these shots. But uh, watching blue whales from a boat is one thing. Watching them aerially is a different thing. Uh, I know there is a lot of aerial whale watching safaris now at Mirista using light aircrafts but the best way to do it is from a helicopter. And once the Sri Lanka tourist board wanted uh, an aerial shoot of whales of Mirissa uh, for their advertising. So they, they asked me and 
I think my good friend Dilum to do the video. So we were on a Bell uh, 412 helicopter, twin engine with uh, inflatable rafts fixed. The Air Force doesn't take any chances. But the good thing with the Air Force is that these pilots are amazing. They would come down to even 500 feet when we wanted it to. And a, and a fast flying uh, light aircraft can't do that because you know it's so fast that it just has to maintain a certain amount of speed. So you just get one pass and if you miss it, by the time you turn around and bring the aircraft back, you miss the opportunity, unless, of course, another whale surfaces. A different game with helicopters. It's expensive to fly, but if you can get them, what you see from the sky is absolutely stunning. So we spent about, we were given one hour at sea. So we had, uh, we had, uh, we had the ferry time of the helicopter, and then the captain said, we'll give you 45 minutes. What we see is what we see. And we got lucky. We saw blue whales and we also saw the sperm whales. And this shot was rather special to me because I was, when this moment happened, I didn't know the, the, the side doors were open of the helicopter because it was a special shoot. We were harnessed twice because if you fall off, then uh, you just hope for luck that you won't, you know, uh, have a serious accident. So the Air Force is very professional. They harnessed us twice. There were two gunners, professional airmen to help us with equipment. And the pilot tilted the helicopter one sideways and I said, I, I think I can see a blue whale. And I was using a 500 millimeter heli at the time. And the, the, suddenly the blue whale came into my, my eyesight and it filled the frame. So the camera just fired maybe at 12 frames per second and two or three frames caught it. But I just wish that the helicopter was 100 feet higher because I marginally clipped the tail. That's the best I could do because as you can see on the other end, nose is at the very edge of the frame. So uh, I wish I was using a shorter lens. There's so many things you can wish once the moment passed, but this photograph actually shows why this animal is called the blue whale, because it's pretty much a gray looking animal. But when it just goes beneath the waves, the animal starts glowing in, in a very turquoise blue until it, uh, until it vanishes that, uh, until it loses that illumination. So it's only in that first 15 to 20 feet that glow is there. That's why they call the blue whale. And I managed to catch this almost by luck because it was utter flying skills of that captain who saw the whale coming in because you're doing a little circle. You don't hover at sea because it's dangerous. You're doing a little circle and you just get, it's easier than an aircraft because the aircraft goes fast, but even helicopter, it needs to go on the circle and tilt at that right moment. And there was, we got the shot. But then underwater is completely different. I don't die. I, I only snorkel. Uh, and I'm pretty much scared of the sea, though I do a lot of work with the whales, not like my crew and sometimes my daughter smokes snorkels with the whales, but I'm, I'm pretty much careful with the water. So what I do is I develop my own technique of using an underwater housing on a, on a uh, 5D Mark III. And I bend down. I, you need to look after your, 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 your waist, though. I bend down from the boat when the boat gets very close to a sperm whale and I dip the camera with my hands about one and a half feet in the water and I blindly shoot. So when I do this, I don't know what I'm shooting because the camera doesn't have a tilting LCD, but you just, you just get the angle, you get the hang of it and you know what, what you're using with a 15 millimeter lens, what you're covering. So you take a lot of shots and sometimes you get the perfect shot. So that was one of those moments. You can't do this with the blue whale because blue whales are very, very shy. They're very skittish and within 50 feet of them, uh, they'll turn away. They're extremely innocent, skittish animals. But sperm whales are very curious. They'll come very close to you, almost like dolphins. And, and if you want to do this from the boat, yes, you can do that. Well, you can actually join me in Trinco, March, April next year, and we'll help you get this shot. So this was the, the, the dive. Uh, the next moment after this, you can see the entire pod. There was about 15 sperm whales around the boat and it crouches up, makes this angle of the body. And there you go. It's like a, a, you know, a Los Angeles class submarine. It kind of glides down to the depths, possibly dives a kilometer, looking for its favorite food, the giant squid. Amazing animals. They can hold their breath for about 25 minutes and, uh, you know, Talking about sperm whales is another subject. So now let's talk about India. Uh, 2014, I went to India trying to set up outbound safaris with, uh, with the team I work. And uh, 
I was in Rantabo initially. Uh, that was uh, recommended as one of the best parks and I still think it is one of the best parks, very, very pretty park. And uh, this is Krishna. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Krishna is a, is a daughter of the much known, much celebrated Machli. Uh, Machli meaning Lady of the Lakes in Rantambo. She passed away or died uh, about two years ago. I saw Machli. I was lucky to see her in 2014. Uh, this is one of the daughters, Krishna. And this lady is very close to my heart because this is actually the first tiger or tigress I saw. And it was my first safari to the park. I was there mid-April. Uh, we had been in uh, Madhya Pradesh doing some bird shoots. And we then drove eight hours to Rajasthan, Savai Madhipur, and then we went into the park. We slept overnight. Next day morning, I was in a, my first safari was in a canter, not even in a private jeep. So there were like 22 Indians on it. Some were making a lot of noise. We were, we were at a crossroad and everybody was waiting for the tiger to come out. There were lots of alarm calls, but then all of a sudden, this magnificent animal came out. And uh, since then, I would have seen her almost every year whenever I went to Rantambo. And it's a very, very special tiger. Uh, and I also like to photograph big cats with a little bit of space, foreground and background. It's nice to take tight shots, but it is also lovely to take uh, a little bit of the habitat the animal comes in, lives in with. It shows how beautiful these animals live in their own uh, jungle. Now, this is again Krishna. Uh, four years back, after I saw her first, and this is Krishna. And these are the three other new cubs she has. These cubs would have now left the mother by now. This was in 2018. Uh, I was there for five days. And every morning, I used every bit of influence I can to get zone four. Because I heard that uh, Krishna's cubs are seen in these water holes uh, around nine o'clock. So everybody was going to zone two, three, because tiger sightings are definite on those zones. You're seeing one, two, three tigers every day. But then there were three of my uh, guests and friends with me. So I said, look, every morning we have an option. We can go to zone two or three. We can 100% guaranteed you can see tiger, but we can also go to zone four. We may not see anything, but if we see it, we'll see Krishna and the three cubs. And these guys are fantastic. They said, look, we are with you, Chitral. So three days we went, we returned with nothing. And you must see when we come for breakfast around 10 o'clock, all our friends are previewing their great left tiger pictures on zone two, three, and zone six. And I'm saying, ouch, you know, it hurts because now you're, you've done three full sessions on, on zone four and nothing. And comes day four, I told my friends, one more day, are you up to it? They said, yes. And there they were. So that was uh, such a rewarding experience after going there for four consecutive days. The fourth morning paid off. And we had an amazing 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so with these grown cubs. They were like 12 to 14 months old. There was uh, two boys and a girl and Krishna. This was in Tadoba National Park. Uh, this was actually mid last year. Uh, they do like in Yala create little... Uh, uh, cement water holes to, to kind of let the tigers ease off their thirst during the dry months. That's the only problem with the photograph because we, we went out in the evening and we, we heard that the tiger is sleeping in the forest. The monkeys were giving occasional calls. So there were three jeeps. We thought we will bank the entire evening hoping that the tiger will come out. He came out by around five o'clock, walked to the closest water hole. Sadly, it was a cement water hole, but the reflection was almost near perfect. And that pink tongue, you know, it's almost like it's got lipstick on it. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty picture, sans the cement border, but then sometimes, you know, that's what you get. Uh, this is Bandavga. Uh, year before last, I was with a, I was on a, on a private tour with some friends. Uh, uh, we were on a zone where this lovely lady had three cubs and uh, we, were, we saw it almost two, three times, but then that one evening, the cubs are sleeping with the mother and then got up and started playing with, the, with themselves and with the mother. And at one moment, uh, you know, this little cub came and gave a hug to the mother. It's almost like what our children would do, uh, you know, when we pick them up from Montessori. So, it, you know, it just shows the amount of love, the tenderness in the natural world. These are the jaws and the claws that will bring down a, a large samba or a, or a buffalo. But 
they, they, they are so timid and lovable with their offspring. And these young cubs just can't have enough of their mother. So, so I always tell youngsters and young photographers, look for these moments that becomes a, like, a, like, a, like a message of animal behavior to the world. Because when you capture moments that showcases animal behavior, it can actually create more love of the natural world amongst those who doesn't have it. And uh, then share it with, you know, through social media and amongst friends so that we can all create more love towards these amazing animals. And it's, it's interesting that we are, we are talking about India and tigers today. Today happens to be the International Tiger Day. Uh, and uh, this was a couple of years back. We were watching two uh, sub-adults in zone six of Rantambo. But all of a sudden, on the back, did you see a little chipmunk, a little squirrel, a three, three, uh, five-stripe squirrel was brave enough to climb this uh, sub-adults back. And I was looking through the camera. Most of my friends were not because these guys are posing for us for almost half an hour in perfect light. They possibly taken 100 images and they just left their cameras on the bean bag and taken a break looking over the camera. But I always tell my, my, my students and my kids, uh, if you're a wildlife photographer, if you have something in front of you, you're better off watching it through the lens rather than over the camera. And all of a sudden, I noticed through the camera, because it was a 600 millimeter, I could see it even more than my naked eye, that the little chipmunk climbed the tiger. I don't know what it was chasing. And the tiger possibly didn't even feel it because it's such a little, little you know, animal that was brave enough to climb the tiger. Perhaps it didn't know what it was doing. It came up, peeped above, maybe gave me two seconds, and it ran away. And I gave a burst, and my friends asked me, Chita, what are you shooting? I said, look something really funny happened and I previewed the camera and all of them, all of a sudden they all say, oh shoot, you should have told me. I said, look, there was no time, right? It was just two seconds, right? So I said, I'll, I'll share the picture with you. But that's why I say, if you're there, if you're there, out there, if you have something in your, in your, in front of you, watch it, enjoy it, spend the time through the lens and you never know what happens because why is it such that it can surprise you? Uh, this is Bandabga last year, July. It was extremely warm. I mean, you know, Indian jungles can be unforgiving. It can be 44, 45 degrees Celsius in, in early July. And, uh, and, and it, it is extremely, extremely hard. We were not only drinking a liter of water per safari, we were pouring a liter of water on our heads just to keep, keep ourselves cool. But it's rewarding because uh, you're there, the tigers are water loving animals amongst all big cats. I think it's only the tigers and the jaguars that takes to the water naturally. And uh, when they do, and if you're there, you know, magic happens. Let's go to Africa. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a, a little few slides on Kenya and a few other parts of Africa. Uh, I, I ventured out to Africa uh, about 21 years ago, initially when I first went to the Mara and I just fell in love with it. It's not only the, the natural world, the unlimited, unending vistas of photography, the open plains, the brilliant sunrises and the unbelievable sunsets just paints a great picture on a photographer's mind. So I, I just kept on going to Africa at least every other year. And in the last six years, I've been returning every year because we're running now photographic tours there. Uh, and always pick the right seasons. Don't go to Africa when the, when the rains are there, unless there are photographic opportunities in Kenya, in Zambia with the rain. So plan the trip, know where you're going, why you're going, what you're aiming at. And if you're at the dry months of July, August, and then early September, don't ever miss the sunrise in Africa. It is spectacular. And Kenya is magic. I mean, if you track these animals, uh, with your guides and them I mean, the driver guides are fantastic. These Maasai guides just, you know, blows you over. They are amazingly intuitive with the, with the wildlife. And uh, once you connect with them, they will deliver. If you're there for five days, it's ample time. If you're there for seven days, it's almost luxury. You don't have to spend more than that during the perfect season. And with a little patience, with a bit of an eye, with the right skill and gear, you can take amazing photographs and you will actually come back with hundreds of great images. Now, just photographing cheetahs is great, but I was watching these three brothers trying to hunt 
and there was this one moment. I, I of course, kept a, quite a distance because I was shooting off a 600. I wanted to catch the foreground and the background, and I left a distance. We kept on giving that distance to the cats, and that one moment they paused and posed for me and, and all of us in the jeep. It almost looked like a bunch of cheetahs. Somebody joked with me saying it's a cheetah with three heads. I don't think so. But it's just that the position, the, the way they are kind of assembled makes an unusual photograph. And that's what you get. That, and when you capture that, it becomes slightly out of the ordinary. And that's what we are, we are after, isn't it? Because in today's world, good photographs are common. All of us are good photographers. All of us have great gear. So how do you make it a little special is by waiting for that moment. And if you're patient, nature will give you that moment. I was in Zambia, in South Luangwa, a uh, year before last with my daughter. We were on a reke. We were just with some friends. Uh, beautiful park. Absolutely breathtakingly beautiful park. Lions, leopards. It's very good for leopards. And then, of course, during the season, the carmine beaters, they nest in colonies, which, you know, it's breathtaking. But this day was lucky. There was a hippo that had died, and the lions were feeding on it. And after a while, this lion walked away. And the moment the lion walked away, a bunch of vultures came and sat on the carcass and that irked the lion and he turned in a hurry and charged the vultures. So this was the first shot of the series of the lion turning and that little bit of droplets of water flying with the movement makes the photograph. So I always say, if you're keen on action, keen on making action look dramatic, look for the dust, look for the water. That's what makes the action very dramatic. Well, the, the gathering and the, the crossing is, is absolutely spectacular. The, migra the great migration happens every year. It's on right now, though, though we, none of us can go there because of the airport problems. But I always like to take either wide shots of this or tight shots of just showing the struggle. I mean, we go there, we fly to Kenya, we go to the Mara to see this amazing uh, event, a, a, a great spectacle of the animal world. But... I must say it's a huge struggle for these animals, you know, and the struggle is even made more so by a careless driver who parked his Land Cruiser right across the path where the wildebeest is trying to get off the cliff. So that's almost heartless. So it's a great thing for us to go and take these pictures, but don't forget these animals are really, really struggling and uh, it's a painstaking moment for them. Uh, eye level photographs. I know a lot of photographers nowadays go out of their way. They walk not extra one mile, but I would say a couple of extra miles to get eye-level photographs. It is interesting. I like eye-level photography myself, but it's not a must. It doesn't always have to be eye-level. Nowadays, with mirrorless, with flippable LCD screens, you can actually hold the camera down and get an eye-level shot much easier than our usual uh, Canons and Nikons, which used to have non-flippable LCD screens. So it's getting easier now. Camera manufacturers are helping this. This was in Kenya. We were watching a pride of lions sleeping and they woke up around four o'clock and the, 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 the main uh, female immediately started stalking and started uh, trotting. It was not a full charge, but a trotting towards the target. And we were on a little depression. My driver was brilliant. He said, all right, I'll get to the depression so that you could get eye level. And it was eye level. I was shooting off a 600 again easily 40 meters distance between the Jeep and myself. So I have the time and the space. If you get too close, you might have to change lenses. So I love to keep a bit of distance so that I have that playing time and to get these shots. And you know that one moment, the lioness is almost airborne. Eyes all focused on what's going to hunt and it kind of tells the story. So wildlife photography is always about catching a moment that tells the story in the wilderness. And if you do that, uh, the pictures are very, very exciting. And then they bring down the wildebeest. It's not a pleasant sight. I know some ladies are watching and I'm not going to keep this slide on for too long. It's very gory to see a wildebeest being brought down, but that's, that's the circle of life, right? It has to happen. It's like you and I going to the supermarkets and buying chicken and mutton and everything we like to eat. Somebody else has done the work for you. These animals are braver than us. They do it themselves. And the good thing with them is that they don't hunt for pleasure. They only kill just to survive, just to eat. And some of us, some humans hunt for pleasure. It makes us worse than animals sometimes. This was the last year I was in Kenya and we were watching these two brothers. They were sleeping and cheetahs generally hunt after four o'clock in the evening because 
you know, you know that cheetahs have a problem of overheating when they run too much. And this is a full-blooded charge. And uh, this was the moment it brought down one of the, the reed bugs. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was at a distance. It, this happened about 70 meters from the Jeep. We were shooting over the Jeep. We were on big bean bags, 600 millimeter, without a teleconverter. I was panning and shooting. I was hoping that I'll catch this moment where the cheetah just gives that final leap. It's totally airborne. And you can see the claws tripping the, the prey and it falls. And of course, then it goes for a kill bite. Uh, it just happens. You know, it happens very fast. Sometimes it happens very close by. Sometimes it happens fast. But the key thing is when it's going to happen, get your settings right. You need to know whether you want to do a slow pan and catch the motion or you want to freeze the frame. And, and make sure that you put the settings, make sure you put your ISO and your shutter speed to that right moment so that you get what you desire for. And when you get it, it's fantastic. This is another day. The two brothers caught a young wildebeest. Uh, it's difficult to watch it because sometimes these are small cats. It's not like lions where they go for a kill bite and make sure that the prey is dead before they feed on it. Cheetahs sometimes, one, one, one cheetah holds down the young wildebeest and the other one immediately starts feeding on it. That's the way nature is. It's cruel sometimes, but that's the way they also survive. But I'm, I'm putting these pictures. You can see the blood on the nose. They'll feed fresh. Cheetahs never return to a kill like lions and leopards do. They don't, they never feed on uh, putrefying flesh. They make a kill, eat their quota, they walk away. That's it. They never return. They don't even have a chance of returning because by the time they walk away, the hyenas and the vultures would be there and that's it. So they, they just take the first portion and that's it, fresh meat, and they walk away. This is another day, uh, the three brothers, I, it was late in the evening, but I actually put the ISO to 10,000 because I wanted to get the, the noise. Because sometimes as much as we try our best to avoid the noise, getting the noise, the exaggerated noise is also nice. Because during my very young days when we were filming or, or shooting with the Nikon F4s and using 800 millimeter uh, 800A say film, which is not sometimes available in Sri Lanka. So we had to either go to Singapore or get a friend who is in Singapore to pick up these uh, Fuji 800A say a film. I used to enjoy the grain. I used to shoot leopards uh, late evening in Yala from a bungalow and use 800 to catch capture the, the noise. So nowadays we have the luxury of just turning a dial and increasing the ISO. So when you go to 10,000 on software, you can boost the noise a little more and you actually convert the, the photograph into a semi-painting. And of course, again, you can make it black and white, you can make it sepia. So you play with these photographs. You know, when you photograph for a really long time, often you want to now do something creative with it. You're not tampering with the photograph. You're not using Photoshop. I don't even have Photoshop in any of my laptops. I only have Lightroom and ACDC Pro 9. So I'm just working with the parameters available, which are good enough to apply a photograph to a BBC competition. We are not cutting and pasting, we are not erasing anything, but the usual parameters, you have the freedom and it's, it's your, your capture, you can work with it. In Kenya, if you're there, if you want to see the large herds, you must go to Ambusili. Uh, and Ambusili is the best place to see large herds in, uh, in Kenya. And we did Ambusili extension just for this, because that's the park you get desert-like terrain, blue sky and amazing elephant herds walking. And this was a very special day. I do have a beetle cam. That's a little toy. Uh, you can mount a DSLR on a radio control buggy and you can drive the buggy and remote trigger the camera uh, with a space of about 100 meters. So I, I was crazy enough to carry the beetle cam all the way to Kenya. And uh, you know, this was the day you know, where you, you kept the beetle cam, we reversed the Jeep, the elephants approached and I got this shot. So it's, it's ground upwards and it's a very, very, you know, a, a, a very different angle. It's, it's a profound effect. Sunsets in Africa is special. And if you see a giraffe at 5.30, 5.45 in the evening, my advice is forget the cats, follow the giraffes till the sun sets. Because the effects you get with these animals as silhouettes cannot be beat. Uh, big lions, I mean, it's always nice. You don't always catch them with a, with a higher elevation and the sun, but any animal with the sunset makes brilliant pictures. Silhouettes is a must-do if you're in the African uh, savanna. 
and don't forget, catch something when the sun goes down and go for the silhouettes. This was a very special day. I was in the Kicheche Private Conservancy, the Olok Olare Private Conservancy. So because you're in the conservancy, it's a little more expensive, uh, the tickets, but you have the flexibility of getting down and getting a low angle shot. You don't get down when, when, you, are, when you have lines though. So you can see this is the depression. The road comes and dips here. So we went down the dip. I was with Paul. Paul owns the Kicheche camp. So I was in his own camp. And uh, this little cub was sleeping from five o'clock till quarter past six. And I actually wanted to go and see something else, but Paul said, no, Chitra, we're gonna bank ourselves. I hope that this cub will wake up when the sun sets. And this is at 6.20 in the evening, when the sun it is, is, is at its absolutely orange burst. And the little cub gets up and yawns. And man, I was happy because I invested that golden hour in Kenya. And I hope this fellow will cooperate when, and the Lion King did. A uh, few slides in Brazil. Uh, we've operated uh, photographic tours to Brazil and it's amazing. You're there to see many mammals, hundreds of new birds, but the main focus is the big cat, the ghost in the Pantanal, and there is the, the jaguar. So you're on steel boats. You can take off the life jackets uh, every now and then. And we modified the tripods to suit the, the bounciness of the boats. And this is what you get. Uh, I got this shot of an amazing male jag uh, hiding in the, in the mangroves. And I, I titled this Ghost in the Darkness. It's just exactly that. It is an absolute ghost. It hunts profusely. And it also hunts by day. So this is a very, very aggressive cat. It'll feed all day. And it's always looking for food. And low angle, this is what you get because you're on a boat on the Cuyaba River and the cats are performing on both sides of the banks. So it doesn't get any better, right? Because you are anyway low eye to eye. So you are on a low angle modified tripod, bean bags, and you're shooting eye to eye with one of the most fearsome big cats of the world. So if you have a chance to go to Brazil, don't miss it. Uh, I was all set to go this September. Now with the COVID fears, I can't. I'll be returning in 2021. This was one of the very special moments that trip. We were watching this male walking on white sand very late in the evening and all of a sudden he charged and we didn't know what it was charging. I just burst fired the 1DX Mark II and uh, on the film, on the, on, the, on the image, I saw a dove flying off. So that's why I say it's a very angry cat. It charges even a bird on the sand. Hungary, I was fortunate to host Bense Mate in Sri Lanka and then he invited me and Ifam Raji to Hungary. Uh, so if you fly to Budapest and then you drive three, three hours to his private estate of 60 acres and he's an artist. He manipulates the environment to give you backgrounds as you would dream to capture birds. And this is what you get. You have a series of hides. You have to book which hide you want to spend the next few days. We, there, we were there for six days and we got a chance of spending time in all of those hides. So what you do is you take your bread, your biscuits, your cheese, your beers if you want, coke or water, go and sit down in the morning, you return only in the evening. So eight hours of photography in a hide, two or three people, and it's very, very fulfilling. This is the sun rising uh, in, 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 in the Hungary sky, uh, late evening, and the, 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 the uh, herons are performing. And the skies are clean, it's pure air, and the photographs can be absolutely brilliant. This was again one of the herons uh, fishing. Uh, the water is, the lake is so still, and it's, it's almost like fishing off a, a little tub. And you can actually catch the moment where the fish just lift, fish is lifted off the water level, and it's, it's alive, it's struggling, and the water is still pouring off the fish, almost a perfect reflection. And I really don't see taking this image anywhere else other than in, in Bense's Heights. Maybe next year, May is a good time. I might return to Bense's Heights next year, but it's for pure bird watching lovers and people with tons of uh, patience. Uh, Madhya Pradesh, India, we were there to see the skimmers. So we, we were at the Chambal River Lodge uh, on the river on a boat. Uh, but luckily there were little flocks of uh, comb ducks as well. But what we didn't bargain was to get both species on the same frame. There was this one skimmer, a naughty skimmer, who started harassing the comb duck. And the comb duck 
expanded the wings just to kind of make itself look bigger and intimidating. And there we were. I was using a 500 millimeter lens. It was perfect uh, lens, uh, focal length. And you got the shot where you went uh, looking for the skimmer and you also got the skimmer along with the comb depth. A few arty images to end the slideshow and then we will uh, we'll be very happy to have a discussion and you know answer some images. I always advise my, my, my children and my students to photograph against the light. Don't always have, try to have the light behind you, which is the old school, which is always the good way, the easy way to do it. But if you have the time, if you work in the Mara, if you work in a private conservancy, drive around the sun and try to have it side lighting the subject or right against it so that you can catch the, the rim light. Slow pan is a different art. It's a time where you are, you know, when you know you can afford to miss the opportunity, go for it. Because there is no guru who can teach you to get a perfect shot. You can, we can tell the art, we can tell you how the skill is, and I'm sure most of us know the skill, but even the best at it will miss it any day. But it's about shooting many shots and catching that one moment that is perfect. This was a little lion cub, little Simba, who was running towards his mother, and uh, I would have shot maybe... 50 shots of it, and that one frame was near perfect, slow plan, one fifteenth of a shutter, and there you are. This was just 10 days ago in Yala. I was there and the weather wasn't too uh, predictable. It was raining every now and then. And during the morning safari, it opened up and a lot of rain. And this is just Villa Pala, however. All the deer started, you know, moving in the rain. And I thought I'll drop the shutter speed. This was one fifth of a second uh, using a 300 millimeter 2.8 on a bean bag. And a slow pan, I did take about 25 shots. And this possibly is the closest to what I wanted to have. It's still not perfect, but you can keep trying this. This is the Mara. This is a lucky one. When I planned the trip, I never knew that it was a full moon. I must confess, I, it was a fluke. Uh, I, uh, the, the poem was planned so that people doesn't have to take much leave. But we landed there, first safari in the evening. And we had a perfect sunset. And then I told my guy, we were having uh, uh, evening sundowners around the, uh, on the conservancy and the moon was rising. And I told my drivers, I said, look, I said, James, if you can find me a giraffe with the moon rise, that would make the perfect day. And within five to eight minutes, he spotted the giraffe and we went crashing there, got off the jeeps because the private conservancy, I was kneeling on the ground, uh, sure hoping that there were no sidewinders there. <laughs> Any serpent would have got us. But... 6.50 in the evening, uh, on your knees, one four thousandth uh, of a second, uh, your, your ISO was raised, I think, as much as 5,000 because it was hand-holding a 600 millimeter in, in, in moonlight, but that's the shot we wanted to get. Myself, Shamindra, and Paul Goldstein, we, all three of us got this shot. I think Paul got a better shot because he was positioned more to the left and he had the giraffe silhouette smack in the middle of the moon. This was eight minutes after that. The moon was still rising, but that was again a, a, a solitude shot. It, it's a moment in the Mara. I would, if I have to caption this, I'll say a moment in the Mara. It just shows the, the moonlight in a perfect uh, full moon day, illuminating the, in the, in, in the savannah and a single giraffe looking towards the moon. It doesn't get any better. So just always look for these dates, plan your trips carefully. Uh, I put this picture because it was in Pench National Park in India and all my, my guests and my friends were shooting large lenses. I used the 2.8, 70 to 200 lens for this because I wanted to catch the, the habitat. So I, 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 I felt that rather than going tight with this huge tigress, I would take the habitat and it kind of make it look more, you know, a, a cat in its habitat rather than a very tight frame. Uh, Zambia, another lucky day, a dead hippo in the, the Luangwa River. And we were watching it for maybe two hours. And all of a sudden, when the lions left and the vultures left, there was a whole bunch of oxpeckers who came and sat there. I was with my daughter, Ashi, and all of them started calling. And we took these pictures and it flew away, possibly lasted five to eight seconds. And when I previewed this, I said, all these chaps are looking in one direction. And Ashi said, it's like this British group, One Direction. Now you got to name it One Direction. That's what we did. <laughs> it was, we had a good laugh in the jungle. 
So it's always nice to, you know, stay with your loved ones in the, in the wilderness, take these shots and enjoy it. Uh, dusk shots, we're coming to the sunset back in Yala. Uh, if you're in a bungalow, if you get lucky, Rukwila Cubs, uh, about six years ago, uh, they were always there on the rocks late evening and the sky gets very, very blue. And, uh, you know, these shots, uh, they are semi-silhouettes, but it's very pretty. Again, late evening, uh, if you catch the silhouette, go for it. You don't catch too much of light uh, with the, on the animal because the sun is on the wrong side or it will possibly be just the silhouette, but it's very arty. Look for those moments. Uh, this is Mahasilava in Yala. Uh, I, I, this is last year. I know Mevan is uh, switched on with the chat. Uh, Mevan, is, Mevan has a lovely image of the same location on a rock, a leopard. So it, 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 it's even more exciting. So you get the, the Basas lighthouse at the horizon here. Uh, the park, the blue ocean, the Indian ocean, the sand, the green, Yala, and you have the elephant. So it just shows what a beautiful park it is. It is not many national parks in the world has a border with an ocean. And when you have it, use it whenever you can. If you have cubs, if you have any half a chance to go for any cub or calf, go for it because they're naturally cute. I was again in Kenya last year. I was in one private conservancy and my guide said in the neighboring conservancy, we hear that there are six cubs. There were six cubs, there are, the sixth one is off the frame. So we, we, we had to pay additionally $78 per person to get to this additional conservancy. But I said, okay, we're gonna do that one evening. We went there by two o'clock, spent the entire evening and the mother and the cubs came out by about six o'clock, gave us this moment, and well, we would, have, we would have spent more than $78 for that. So keep your switches on, talk to your guides. The guides on the ground will know best of the, what the great opportunities are. As I said, the cubs are there, go for it. Cubs are always playful, uh, and if the right light is soft, if you catch it, catch them in the golden hour, it's always magic. And Cubs is the next generation. They're full of life. They'll never disappoint you. They'll always be acting for you. This is back in Yala. This is a very old shot. Uh, this is uh, as old as eight years ago. Uh, this is a Rukwila. At the time, this was the third set of cubs we were observing in Rukwila of the same mother. Thereafter, the mother changed. That mother probably lost its territory. Maybe she passed away through age. And then another female took over. Now there is new studies on leopards in Yala, but this was the third set back in 2012-13. And uh, we, I, was, I was actually using uh, a Nikon system as well at the time. And I had a Nikon uh, camera with a Sigma 800 millimeter monster lens. It's not a stabilized lens, so you gotta be very careful using that beanbag lens, another beanbag on top. But one late evening, I was at the Butova bungalow, the little cubs came out and gave me this picture perfect pose, uh, you know, almost like in the studio. And, you know, I, I, I still cherish this moment and I thought I must share that with you. And lastly, this was the two uh, twin, uh, twins in Mineria National Park, the, twi the, the twins that were born to a, a mother uh, when the news is out. I was there with Dr. Prithi Viraj. I did a little video and I uploaded it on my Facebook because Dr. Prithu and my team is doing a elephant research based at uh, the Cinnamon Lodge, it's five years old. We have now identified 307 elephants and we have with the Department of Wildlife collared two females. So that the satellite collars are giving us uh, blips and where the herds are moving every eight hours. So I'll be very happy to share with you if any one of you like to see the progress on the research. But uh, Dr. Prudhu and I were in the park and we got lucky. Dr. Sumit was already there and he called us and said, look, this is the location, the, car the calves are out. We drove there. And I was doing a film, but I always switch between still and film to capture both. Uh, and at about 5.35, 5.40, just about time for us to turn back, the elephants crossed the road to the right side, now with the light behind me, uh, and, and just gave this moment where the little twins, you know, posed for me for about five to eight minutes, and it was a perfect, perfect uh, evening. And that's my own calf. <laughs> I always tell people, Enjoy the times you spend in the jungle. Uh, it doesn't get any better than the times you spend with your family. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions with all our friends this evening.